Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. And in the news this week, is there a light at the end of the tunnel for Burdick Street repairs? And who is the cowboy in town? Stay tuned. The Oxford News begins right now. The Village of Oxford may have a solution to how to finance both reconstruction of the section of Burdick Street known as Cemetery Hill or Pothole Hill and a proposed East Edison Alley project. You may recall that the Edison Alley uh, project calls for construction of two-lane road just east of M24 from Ensley Street to the Holy Cross Lutheran Church parking lot. An additional one-lane road would then be constructed from the alley's southern, southern end to M24. Both roads would contain bicycle lanes, and these new uh, roads would ease some traffic congestion from M24 and spur additional commerce in the area. $800,000 is the total cost for both projects. Due to the advice of their township attorney, a uh, request for village township officials for possible funding of the project was refused. Seeking other alternatives, the village manager, Joe Young, has authorized the municipality's bond council to draft a resolution for village council vote in which a five-year bonds would be issued to cover the necessary expenses. Oxford Village Council will vote on the issue at the next regular meeting. Did you know we have an honest-to-goodness cowboy and rodeo competitor living in Oxford? This is the sixth season. 28-year-old Steven Stetler has been competing in the National Rodeo Steer Roping Competition. To win the competition, Steven partnered with another cowboy. He roped while his partner hogtied for the win. Last year, Stevens roped his fastest time yet at 4.8 seconds in Fort Worth, Texas. The world record is 3.10 seconds. Is Stevens hoping to represent Cowboy Good Boys in our upcoming Lone Ranger Parade? I sure hope so. Oxford is losing both a pastor and a government official, Reverend Kevin Miles, pastor of the Oxford Village Methodist Church, will be leaving in mid-June to take on new responsibilities in Davison. Although he has only been in Oxford since 2013, Pastor Miles became quite active in the community after being appointed to Oxford Downtown Development Authority. He was also an active participant with the Lone Ranger Committee. Reverend Miles, who has been in the ministry for 23 years, also emphasized to his congregation the importance of increasing the church's community involvement. His final comment, he was going to miss Oxford, and I believe Oxford will miss Reverend Kevin Miles. A West Bloomfield fire truck was spotted recently in Oxford Township, but not for an assist. The truck was honoring the service of retiree firefighter Larry Bradford by giving him a ride home from his last day of work. The 24-year Oxford resident retired from Bloomfield Hills Fire Department after over 30 years of service to that community as a firefighter and paramedic. He may have retired from fighting fires, however, Bradford plans to continue his part-time window cleaning service. Good luck to you, Mr. Bradford. New President of the Oxford Chamber of Commerce, Debbie Earn, said that the process of choosing a chamber director is almost over. Earn uh, says that the new chamber, as it is referred to, intends to have greater interaction with its members, village officials, and other community organizations. Restrictions are on, but not for your waistline. It is to protect our quickly crumbling roads. Oakland County Road Commission began enforcing the springtime road weight restrictions. So if you're driving a truck or pulling a trailer that exceeds road weight restrictions, you just might want to receive, you might receive some bad tidings. Help preserve the integrity of our roads and go to our OCC website to see the weight limits. Well, Terry, what, what should we talk about now? <laughs> bumpy roads, bumpy story to get through. Roads. All kinds uh, of bumpies. <laughs> yes, speaking of bumpies and bumps in the road, twice this week I've seen um, squashed snapping turtles in the middle of Lakeville Road. Now, Elgin, do they jump out in front of your car, or do you have time to avoid them? Everyone knows turtles are ferocious. Yeah, <laughs> and fast, right? And fast. <laughs> well, I did a story with Bill last year on our community access that um, 
There was a nasty rumor that one of the sports for younger drivers is to try to tip the turtles over so they spin around. So it's kind of like a frisbee thing. And I believe that's still happening. I, I just want to say there's such a vital part of our environment. And we're proud of what we've got here in our community as far as wildlife is concerned. Um, I know that when they're older, they're going to think it's a terrible thing. So I just want to encourage parents to encourage your children, please don't hit the turtles. I mean, even when you see them on the side of the road dead, you don't have to hit a turtle. There's a good way to go around them. If there's a big thing in the middle of the road, it's not a rock. It could a be turtle. a bear. Yeah. <laughs> no. Instead, it's a turtle. Yeah, it's no, you got to be careful of turtles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other it's little really... wildlife out there, too. They're yeah, little critters that um, can't defend themselves well. Uh, no, especially against a 6,000 pound killing machine, which is a truck or right. a car. And, you know, the. The reason kids are driving cars is to get from point A to point B, not to play mm -hmm. frisbee games trying to spin turtles around. And just think, you know, if, if the shoe were on the other foot and the turtles were playing that game with human beings, not a good thing. <laughs> okay. They'd have to wear a helmet at least, I'm telling you. And I know that's a soapbox thing, but it's just really sad to see dead turtles in the middle of the road. It just doesn't need to happen. Great. And if you want to save our turtles, <laughs> Please spend the money to Terry uh, Stiles. She'll be glad to work it out. Yeah, right. I'll start a campaign. <laughs> so that's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to hear these stories and more, go to your local store and pick a, up a copy of the Oxford Leader. Coming up next on OCTV, more news. First, I watch Auto Talk with Dave Kenny, then School News with John Oceans, uh, then Oxford Local Sports, starring Jim Hughes, and finally, Dave Kenny Science in the News. This is Oxford News This Week, and I'm Terry Stiles. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Come on out for Friday night fish at the Oxford American Legion Hall. It's delicious. We love the Legion. They have great fish and good family fun. American Legion fish fry. It's awesome. And the drinks are good, the food is good, the service is awesome. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the village of Leonard. Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, the University of Michigan's Mobility Transformation Center, along with key partners from a variety of industries, will begin construction of a $6.4 million simulated urban environment for testing of connected and automated vehicles, the university said on May 6th. The off-road five-mile test site to be located on 32 acres of U of M's North Campus Research Complex in Ann Arbor, Michigan, is being designed and built in cooperation with the De Michigan Department of Transportation. A ribbon-cutting ceremony for the test site will take place in mid-September in conjunction with the ITS World Congress. Industry partners, including Ford, GM, Bosch, Xerox, and Econolite, will each donate $1 million over the course of three years to support the MTC and its programs. The goal of the MTC is to lay the foundations of a commercially viable system of connected and automated vehicles, vehicles that communicate wirelessly with one another and with infrastructure to warn of potential hazards and allow increasing automation of vehicle functions. Within the next two years, U of M plans to have 9,000 intelligent vehicles operating in Ann Arbor. By 2021, plans call for demonstrating a working system adding up to 20,000 vehicles across highways in southeastern Michigan. Can't wait for that one. And at Fiat Chrysler, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles will replace its four-cylinder engine lineup with a new family of engines that share common parts and can be inexpensively customized for individual markets. Fiat Chrysler will also introduce gasoline electric hybrids, including a plug-in minivan to broaden the availability of fuel-saving 8 and 9-speed automatic transmissions. It also plans to bring more diesel engines to North America. Bob Lee, Fiat Chrysler's powertrain chief, outlined the company's powertrain plans through 2018 on May 6 to analysts and journalists in suburban Detroit. The new four-cylinder engines will share technologies and parts, enabling them to be tailored to individual markets faster and for less cost. Lee said the new engines will share common parts such as pistons, fuel injectors, and combustion chamber designs. There will also be just two sizes of pistons. 
They also said in 2016, Fiat Chrysler will launch a gasoline electric version of the Chrysler Town & Country minivan, the first of several hybrids. The company is working on a belt alternator stop-start system. Gasoline and diesel engines will share many of the same technologies. He said Fiat Chrysler will use fuel-saving fuel technologies that provide the best bang for the buck that consumers want to buy. He cited dual-clutch transmissions as a technology that delivers excellent fuel economy gains and carbon dioxide reductions, but that has been rejected by American car buyers. Fiat Chrysler offers a dual-clutch transmission in just one low-volume model of the Dodge Dart. Ford Motor Company started, uh, struggled initially with quality and refinement problems with its PowerShift dual-clutch automatic. Lee said the company is bullish on diesels based on the customer acceptance of the optional eco-diesel in the Jeep Grand Cherokee and Ram 1500. And on the recall front, U.S. auto safety regulators have refused a request from two U.S. senators to encourage owners of cars affected by General Motors' ignition switch recall to ground their cars until they can be repaired. The defect, affecting 2.6 million vehicles, has been linked to dozens of crashes in which the airbags did not deploy and at least 13 fatalities. In an April 28th letter, Senators Markey and of Massachusetts and Richard Blumenthal uh, urged the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to advise owners of the recall cars to stop driving them until they can be repaired. NHTSA, in a response to Markey and Blumenthal, said that such an action is not necessary at this time. The agency said it reviewed tests in which GM simulated potholes, panic stops, and angled railroad crossings and concurred with GM's advice to drive with the ignition key on its own rather than on a key ring. And still at GM, General Motors is recalling 56,214 Saturn Aura midsize cars in the United States because the automatic transmission shifters may fail. The automaker is recalling certain 2007 and 2008 model Aura cars equipped with four-speed transmissions because the transmission shift cable could break, according to documents filed with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. If the cable breaks while the car is being driven, when the driver goes to stop and park the vehicle, he or she may not be able to shift to park or remove the ignition key, according to the NHTSA documents. That could increase the risk that the car rolls away if the driver does not apply the park brake. GM will replace the shift cable assembly and mounting bracket at no charge, according to NHTSA documents. The company has not yet provided a notification schedule. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. I've begun to dream of things, of things to come, and tell the trees not to look for me. I'm going to find some peace of mind. Wake the sun. Wake the sun, wake the sun, wake the sun. Separate raw meats from other foods by using different cutting boards. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. 
I'm John Ochens and welcome to the Oxford Wildcat School Update. Seventeen students from our sister school in Teleplanta, Mexico are visiting this week along with teachers and parents. They will be attending classes in our schools, enjoying activities at Echo Grove Park in Leonard, and visiting with host families. International Baccalaureate Exhibition is wrapping up for our fifth graders this month. We caught up with two of the mentors who filled us in on their topics and approach. Pat Bono's group dealt with smoking. Okay, I have a group of three young ladies. Two are in one classroom, one is in another, a separate classroom. Mm -hmm. Their topic is the effects of smoking. And all of them have smokers in their home. So, you know, as part of our introduction, you know, we had to talk about how feelings people could feel about smoking because it, it is very tender to them, it's in their homes. They want their family members to quit smoking. So, in working with them, they have their lines of inquiry, questions that they're going to ask. They interviewed a dental hygienist. We together worked on all the questions, making sure that we were being sensitive to smokers and non-smokers. They talked with a smoker, they talked with a non-smoker, and then we've come together and looked at the results together. We worked on the questions they were going to ask to make sure that you know, they would be appropriate. I sat in on the interview with the dental hygienist, and the kids did great. Andrea Boehner's kids studied education. She explains their course and results. I'm working with um, three girls in Mrs. Kroll's class, and their topic that they chose is access to education. Okay, Mrs. Kroll's class, she's in what school? At um, Oxford Elementary. Oxford oh, yes. Elementary, okay. And she, um, or the topic is access to education and they are looking at just the differences um, that children have both locally because um, they did do an interview with Mrs. Craniac from who now um, is retired from OES and works down in D Detroit Public Schools so she came up and talked to them about just the differences and what it's like to go to school in Detroit and the challenges those kids face versus um, things that they have here or locally in our community and they're also looking globally and they're doing research as far as like education in Haiti and one of the girls fathers through his uh, church is took a trip to Haiti he's actually just got back so they all, they're getting information from him as well just as far as what education is like in that country the challenges they face um, you know what the children don't have have they been surprised I think so I think um, I think the topic when they discussed Detroit was eye-opening. Um, it was a group, and there were several groups with different topics, poverty as well as education, but I think that um, they just didn't realize what some children don't have compared to them. IB mentor Andrea Boehner. Oxford teacher Jennifer Trombley and her kids did something we can all be proud of. At the beginning of the school year, she learned that a friend was battling breast cancer. The chemo led to hair loss, which led to Jennifer inspiring her class to do something positive. She inspired two teachers, seven fourth graders, and one second grader to get a haircut and donate it to wigs for kids. Those ten people donated more than a hundred inches of hair. It was an emotional day. Thanks to the Oxford leader for that photo. Congratulations to Oxford senior Catherine Flanagan for being one of 36 seniors accepted to the University of Toledo College of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Catherine has a 4.1 GPA and will graduate fourth in her class from OHS. She says her inspiration came from an illness she suffered as a sophomore. It took nine months and 26 doctors to diagnose gastroparesis, a gastrointestinal disorder that caused her to lose 25 pounds. Catherine says besides the pharmacy program, she likes UT because of their ballroom dance team. She's good at that, too. In other news, Oxford principals are submitting nominations for the Betty Campion Distinguished Support Service Award and for the Teacher of the Year. Some difficult decisions there. Thanks for joining us. That's the Oxford Wildcat News Update for this week. Stay tuned for Science in the News with Dave Kenny 
and Wildcat Sports with Jamie Hughes. I'm John Ochens for Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. <laughs> the average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Visit us at stoptextstoprex.org. Now, following a very lopsided loss last Thursday to OAA rival Royal Oak, the Wildcat Varsity Boys lacrosse team had a chance to get back to their winning ways in a non-league matchup with Bay City Western at home on Saturday. And the boys did just that behind the play of junior Austin Kreeshock and sophomore Ryan Kimbrough. The Cats clobbered the visiting Bay City years 14-2, winning 17 face-offs and the ground ball battle 43-22. Now what is being considered his best game of the year, Kreeshock scored four goals with three assists and was just ahead of Kimbrough who starting in his very first game at attack, replacing junior Scott Randall, got himself three goals with two assists, earning high praise from head coach uh, Greg Norman who gushed that Ryan is a natural scorer and playing attack makes it that, that easier for him to do what he does best. The rest of the scoring onslaught was aided by Lars Jorgens with two, Nora Grove, Gavin Fritz, Nathan Tilly, Louis Urban, Dominic Bucchini, their parents, the mascot, and even I got a few shots on goal. Now the boys will be home for this next week for two games against uh, our rival, the Mistake on the Lake Orion Dragons on Tuesday and Sterling Heights for senior night Thursday before finishing the season at Holland Christensen on Saturday. So there's plenty of time to get behind this talented team before they start their playoff run Monday, May 19th in the first round of the MHSAA postseason. Now the winning ways continued at Devil's Ridge for the boys varsity golf as they set a new school record for dual match in their 144-155 defeat of Bloomfield Hills High School behind the tiger-like play of Matt Prince, Doug Schultz, J.J. Lewis, Raleigh Gerbenson, Eric Curtis, and Logan Scott. So congratulations boys on that win. Sadly, on the other side of things, though, our Lady Cats varsity softball team had a tough loss of 7 to nothing at the hands of Marion High School. Pitcher Jesse Ubling picked up the loss and went 2-3 and three at the plate, along with Cheryl Banas, who went 1-4. Maddie Dinges went 1-4 also. Sky Donaldson went 2-4. Claire Hermanson went 1-3 at the plate. And Ashley Suzmanski went 2-3. Now the big local pro sports news was this past weekend's 2014 NFL Draft and our lovable Lions hoping to get the players they needed to finally make a championship run. Now anyone who's sadly been following this team shouldn't have been surprised with the Lions' first selection and the 10th overall pick of the very athletic tight end Eric Ebron out of North Carolina. In the past, the Lions have selected early and often big offensive players to add fuel to their passing game, but with the exception of Calvin Johnson, none have really panned out. So hopefully this time around and first, this, this time around first year uh, Lion head coach Jim Caldwell and his staff have learned where past drafters have failed and Ebron will be the real deal. In addition to Ebron, the Lions picked up linebacker Kyle Van Noy from BYU, who they are hoping can make an immediate start as impact player on the strong side linebacker, and center Travis Swanson, who looks to eventually replace longtime Lion and center Dominic Rayola. Now, I'm Andy Curtis. Remember, if you want to give us a sports story or bring to attention a score that I have missed or a name that I have inevitably butchered, please shoot me an email at andrewcurtis23 at gmail.com and put OCTV Sports in the subject line. Now remember also you can catch all Wildcat High School games right here on OCTV weekends from 1.30 to 6 or online at OCCTV.org under the Programs tab. That's all the sports news you need to know. Thanks for watching. You're watching OCTV, Oxford Community Television, serving Oxford, Addison Township, and the Village of Leonard. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, a protein in blood can repair age-related damage in the brains of muscles of old mice, returning them to a more youthful state. Last year, the protein, called Growth Differentiation Factor 11, or GDF11, was found to have a restorative effect on mouse hearts. If it does a similar job in humans, it could have huge potential for treating a wide range of age-related diseases, say the researchers behind the latest work. The idea that an infusion of young blood could regenerate aging bodies was explored several years ago when the circulatory systems of old mice were physically connected to those of young animals as if they were conjoined twins. 
This rejuvenated the stem cells in the bone marrow of the older mice that replenished their blood and led to a wave of studies comparing the blood of old and young mice to try to identify the youth-giving substance. The latest results include two studies from Amy Wager's lab at Harvard University. One explored the potential of GDF-11 in muscle regeneration and the other in brain regeneration. In the brain study, the researchers injected 15-month-old mice, which is just half of their natural lifespan, with GDF-11 daily for a month. The volume of the blood vessels in their brain increased by 50% and the number of brain stem cells by 29%. Both factors are known to improve brain function. In a separate study, a team led by Tony weiss Corre of the Stanford School of Medicine in California gave an 18-month-old mice, that is to say 18-month-old mice, the equivalent of mid to late middle age, eight injections of blood plasma taken from three-month-old mice. Three weeks later, the brain cells of the older mice had 20% more dendrites, and that's the spines that relay messages between neurons, than mice given a placebo. The mice performed about 50% better on two standard tests of cognitive function. We're extremely excited about the clinical possibilities, says weiss Carre. The studies show that the old brain is plastic and can recover function, and this can be done by simply injecting young blood plasma, he says. His team is already planning a human trial. They want to inject blood plasma from young, healthy donors into people with Alzheimer's disease to see if it improves their brain function. We hope to start this year, he says. Can't be too soon. In our next story, who wants to go to Mars? Well, lots of graduates, U.S. citizens, men and women, according to a list of applicants released by Mars One, the, des <laughs> the Dutch organization aiming to colonize the planet by 2025 and televise the process. Think Big Brother, now it's Big Planet. The <laughs> nonprofit now has released details of the 705 applicants who are left after 353 wannabes dropped out for personal or medical reasons. The remaining 418 men and 287 women come from 99 different countries, though 204 are from the U.S. Their ages range from 18 to 71, with 3% over the age of 56 and 43% between the ages of 26 and 35. That means that by 2024, when Mars One is due to launch, a candidate could beat the record for the oldest person in space currently held by NASA's John Glenn, who flew at the age of 77. The biggest difference between the candidates and general population is that nearly two-thirds hold a degree. Nine are law graduates and 12 are medics. The candidates will now be interviewed and split into teams of two men and two women each. And can't wait to see that one. Well, in our last story, the weather is preparing to go wild and will wreak havoc and death around the globe later this year. An El Nino, a splurge of warm water on the Pacific Ocean is coming and it will unleash floods in the Americas while Southeast Asia and Australia face drought. Yet little is being done to address these consequences. The tropical climate system is primed for a big El Nino, says Axel Timberman of the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. An El Nino begins when warm water near Indonesia spreads eastward and rises to the surface of the Pacific. The warm water carries rain with it, so El Nino takes rain from Asia and Australia and dumps it on the Americas. The effects can be deadly. A big El Nino in 1997 and 1998 killed 20,000 people and caused almost $97 billion in damage. Meteorologists contacted by new scientists all expect an El Nino by the end of this year. And it looks like a big one, says Wenju Kai of CSIRO, that is to say CSIRO, Australia's National Research Agency in Melbourne. The more heat in the Pacific, the bigger the El Nino, and right now, 150 meters below the surface, a ball of warm water is crossing that ocean, and it's huge, says Kai. Yet official forecasts remain cautious. As recently as May 5th, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration only said the odds of an El Nino would exceed 50% this year. I hope they're right. Well, that's it for this edition of Science and the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television, and we'll be right back. Thank you.